In 1979, a comedy feature film quickly became one of the most controversial pieces of cinema in history. No film had ever before satirized Christianity so blatantly. See, not so bad, watch you up. And it caused outrage. I mean, it's so disgusting Could when I you think of it. When all you've done is well, to make a lot of people on a cross singing a music, a, a music hall song. A group of rabbis and priests held demonstrations over this past weekend, and they were demonstrating against a movie called The Life of Brian. Protesters around the world marched against The Life of Brian. It was dropped by financiers, banned by councils, states, even entire countries. But it still managed to get shown and still managed to offend seemingly every world religion. These people are operating at a very, very low level of mental health. They are incapable of understanding the teaching. What happened to sticks and stone can break my bone, but words can never hurt me. This is the story of one of the greatest films and one of the greatest cultural battles of modern times. During the 1970s, Monty Python's Flying Circus became one of the most influential comedy programs Britain has ever produced. One of the crossbeams has gone out askew on the treadle. <laughs> but what on earth does that mean? I don't know. Mr Wentworth just told me to come in here and say that there was trouble at the mill, that's all. I didn't expect a kind of Spanish Inquisition. <laughs> Nobody expects the Spanish Inquisition. Our chief weapon is surprise. Surprise and fear. Fear and surprise are two weapons. Our fear and surprise and ruthless efficiency are three weapons. Our fear and surprise and ruthless efficiency and an almost fanatical devotion to the Pope are four. No. The Python team were comedy superstars. They'd made three series of the TV show and become cult stars in the UK and US. The release of their first feature film, Monty Python and the Holy Grail, propelled them to even greater international success. We'd been doing our, our publicity for Grail. It sort of brought us back together again. And I think we must have felt, well, the Grail's going down well. Maybe we should do another movie. The moment was really in, in, in Amsterdam, uh, one of our a drunken pub crawl one evening. And, and that was Eric when he said, you know, wouldn't it be great? Let's do Jesus Christ, Lust for Glory. And you know, I fell off the chair because that was so outrageous and wonderful and spot on. My reaction to the idea of doing a Bible story was slightly disappointing because um, uh, I always thought the costumes were so boring. <laughs> I remember going to a Church of England school and every time we had to do a paint a biblical scene, you know, you thought, oh, it's everybody just in long robes. It's not very interesting. Born in the 1940s, all of the Pythons had received some form of religious education but Christianity was either rejected or distrusted by each. There was a lot of religion thrown at us, but very little that was explained, certainly satisfactorily. I'd been confirmed and I'd sat around for some weeks expecting some golden glow to descend on me, and when it didn't, I became fairly atheistic or humanistic. I was, uh, in many ways, a little zealot. I had read the Bible at least twice by the time I was about 16. Uh, so I knew my stuff. I can do Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua, Judges, Ruth, First and Second Samuels. I can do all those things. And then I decided I'd had enough. So I, I sort of walked away from religion around that time and thought education is better. We were lucky because we shared the same attitudes to what religion wasn't. I don't think you could have ever got the Pythons to agree on what it was, but certainly we agreed on what it wasn't, and that was lucky. The Pythons began work on Jesus Christ Lust for Glory. The first task was to research their subject thoroughly. I remember going with Terry and the others to see screenings of, of other uh, biblical epics like Quo Vadis and Solomon and Sheba and all that. They were pretty dreadful. After about watching three or four of them, we suddenly realised they all had one thing in common. And that was that everybody in the film spoke in this very special way because they were aware that they were talk living at a time when something very wonderful was happening. You know. How blessed are those of gentle spirit! They shall have the earth for their possession. I, mean, I remember saying to the others that, you know, we, people will find our film shocking because it'll be the first biblical film in which people speak in normal voices. Speak up! 
quiet, Mum. Well, I can't hear a thing. Now, are you telling me that's not worth 20 shekels? No. Look at it. Feel the quality. That's not in your goat. All right, I'll give you 19, then. No, no, no. Come on, do it properly. What? Haggle properly. This isn't worth 19. You just said it was worth 20. Oh, dear, oh, dear. Come on, haggle. All right, I'll give you 10. That's more like it. 10? Are you trying to insult me? Me with a poor dying grandmother? 10? Biblical epics viewed and the Gospels reread led all to realize that, artistically speaking, Jesus was not the answer. What began as Jesus Christ, lustful glory, actually gradually moved away from, from that idea simply because they found Jesus Christ wasn't funny. You know, you've got Christ saying very good things and saying the right things and um, as a wonderful figure. So that's not where the, the fun lies, really. Once you start thinking about it, it, it it's kind of, and start just thinking of it in everyday terms, you see, you accept that this happened. But when Mary said to Joseph, you, I'm pregnant, but it's okay, I wasn't with anyone because the Holy Spirit comes down, you know, and then Joseph goes off to the pub and says to his friend, you know, I was a bit worried that my wife was here. It's all all right because she, she, she was impregnated by the Holy Ghost and all his friends say, oh, fine. Well, that's a relief. You see what I mean? The moment you start looking at this stuff, <laughs> there's a funny side to it. You hear that? Blessed are the Greek. The Greek. Hmm. Well, apparently he's going to inherit the earth. Did anyone catch his name? Oh, it's the meek! Blessed are the meek! Oh, that's nice in here. I'm glad they're getting something because they have a hell of a time. The comedy, it seemed pretty clear, was in the interpretation of the, of the gospel. The angle that we all agreed on in the end was that you'd look at the historical situation in Judea at that time. It was a time when the sort of millennium was being sort of thought about again and people were, were expecting God to come down and clean up the world and all that. So people were looking for messiahs. And so the idea of someone being chosen uh, as the messiah, when all, all he is is somebody happens to be around at the same time in the same place, seemed to unlock um, a way of doing this. No! I don't think there was any um, moment when we thought, well, we don't want to do that because it might be blasphemous. Um, it was just really a question of being guided where the comedy was. I was always convinced there was nowhere you couldn't go or you sh shouldn't go more to the point. I think that's there are no sacred cows, and if they are there, if they're really sacred, then let's see how much we can puncture them and see if they still float. They had their angle, but in setting out to lampoon the blindly faithful, the pythons had chosen a dangerous path a path towards possible prosecution for blasphemy, and perhaps even more disturbingly, towards a head-to-head -to -head with the self-proclaimed guardian of Christian morality, Mary Whitehouse. Last Thursday evening, we sat as a family, and we saw a program that started at 6.35. And it was the dirtiest program that I have seen for a very long time.
In 1977, as the Pythons began writing what was now called Life of Brian, events took an ominous turn when for the first time in 50 years a prosecution was brought for blasphemy. Gay News published a poem called The Love That Dares to Speak Its Name. It's a kind of meditation by a centurion at the crucifixion of Christ and he meditates on the wounds of Christ and he rather gets off on these wounds. Mrs. Mary Whitehouse took objection to this particular poem and therefore she launched a private prosecution for blasphemous libel against the publishers of Gay News and the editor of Gay News, Dennis Lemon. Mrs. Whitehouse got after it and if she found anything which caused her particular pain or distress, she immediately bought it and read it and started a, started a law case. She felt inside, you know, that this is Christ being crucified again and that we really cannot stay silent about this. Mrs. Whitehouse and her, her ad adherents prayed in the passages of the Old Bailey. Gay News was convicted. Dennis Lemon was sentenced to nine months in prison, 18 months suspended, fined £500 and Gay News was fined £1,000. So by the time the Gay News trial happened, uh, there was a kind of new definition which actually the judge gave. He said that the particular uh, offence of blasphemy was irreverence, scurrility, profanity, vilification or licentious abuse of the Christian religion. Now, of course, irreverence, scurrility, profanity, vilification and licentious abuse sums up Monty Python humour beautifully. The Pythons decamped to Barbados for two weeks to hone the script without interruptions or family pressures. Terry and I sort of slightly reluctantly agreed, thinking, well, when we go to Barbados, we're just going to want to water ski and swim and eat and hang out. Who's going to want to write a... I think Barbados is really one of the smartest things we did because uh, it's the first time we actually all went away at one time to one place and just locked ourselves off and we laughed and had a wonderful time and I think it was a good way of working because these ideas were thrown around really fast. I think it was in those last two weeks when we were all together um, that really the themes of the film came out. People had written very good stuff, I mean things like the writing on the wall at night in the Latin. I remember John and Graham coming up with that and thinking, this is terrific, this is just what we want. Romanes, Aeon Thomas. People call Romanes, they go the house. It, it says Romans go home. No, it doesn't. <laughs> What's Latin for Roman? Come on, ah, come on. Romanus? Goes light. Annus? Pocket if plural of Annus is. <laughs> Annie? Romani. The script was finished. The next big task was to find funding for the film, between two and three million pounds. It was always going to be a struggle to get backing for such a controversial film, but undeterred, they sent the script to EMI. I sat one sunny Sunday afternoon in my garden, and I've never read a funnier script in my life, before or since. It was just a joy. I told John Gilson that we would like to make the picture. We shook hands, he opened a bottle of champagne, and I was kind of taken aback in a way because, you know, negotiations with, for finance was never supposed to be that easy. With EMI on board, the team looked for a place to film and they soon settled on Tunisia. You have to remember that Tunisia, the monastery, was all set up for biblical epics. That's where they made, I think it was Lou Grade's Jesus Christ with, 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 with Robert Powell and all that. So they had the temples, they had the tabernacles. All these Arab extras were quite used to coming along and being Jews for, you know, sort of day and a half. Pre-production began. Costumes were made, sets began to be built. All that was left now was to decide on the casting. It was becoming clear that the biggest decision would be who was going to play Brian. Graham Chapman was the leading contender, but his notorious heavy drinking was causing concern and John in particular was worried about whether he could cope. John had written with Graham during the days when Graham drank a lot and was kind of absent physically or mentally for a lot of the time. So John was having to do a lot of writing and I think John saw a possible danger that Graham may blow the, the whole film, you know, because of the central character. Graham was getting through two bottles of gin a day, but those were the large ones that you get behind a bar. Pretty colossal. 
he never used the word alcoholic, but he knew darn well that he had to clean his act up. As I understand it, anyway. Graham already knew he would be playing Brian and had really stopped drinking with that in mind. But John Cleese wanted to be Brian too. I wanted to be Brian for one simple reason, which was that I'd never played a role that went all the way through the movie. I'm afraid the rest of us were rather against it because, well, A, I couldn't see John as Brian, quite honestly. Um, and, and B, we, we thought there were all these other parts that we wanted John to do. Come in. Now look, no one is to stone anyone until I blow this whistle. Do you understand? Throw it at the floor, sir. What? Throw him to the floor again, sir. Oh, yes. Throw him to the floor, please. They were right, because they said, no, no, you will be funnier and the film will be funnier if you play the Centurion and Reg. And I was disappointed just because I wanted the experience. But after, very, very soon I realized they were right. And also Graham, who was a tremendously good actor. I think probably potentially almost the best actor of all of us. February 1978, and everything was now in position to start filming. All were ready to leave for Tunisia in several days. And then the boss of EMI, Bernard Delfont, read the script. I suddenly get a, a very, very angry uh, telex in those days from Bernard Delfont, who was chairman of the EMI entertainment section. He said, I've looked rather quickly through the script of the new Monty Python film and I'm amazed to find that it's not the zany comedy usually associated with his films, his films, but is obscene and sacrilegious and would certainly not be in the interest of EMI's image to make this sort of film. Every few words there are outrageous swear words, which is not in keeping with Monty Python's image. This is very distressing to me and is a very serious situation. I thought it's clearly ridiculous. He doesn't know anything about films. He shouldn't be making these judgments. I called him up and um, spoke to him and said, Bernie, you've got the wrong end of the stick, I can assure you, as a Catholic, not a, normally a qualification I use in the film industry, that uh, this is not blasphemous. It really isn't, and um, I don't think we should worry about that. And he had obviously made up his mind that it was, and he, after a lot of spluttering, got, and I argued with him and argued with him, and eventually he lost his temper and, and he used the immortal words. I'm not going to have people saying that I'm making fun of fucking Jesus Christ. It was a mortal blow when EMI pulled out because, um, you know, we had no other option at the time. I actually thought the thing wasn't going to happen. I remember I accepted a role uh, working with Peter Sellers in Vienna doing a remake of Prisoner of Zender. A race to find finance for the film ensued, with Eric Idle and producer John Goldstone departing for America. Eric Idle said, well, you know, the one person that has always been a big Python fan is, is George Harrison, and he lives in the Hollywood Hills, and um, we should really go and see him and talk to him about it. And I think we sent a script ahead of time for him to read. And then, anyway, a miracle. A miracle happened. A miracle. Say, George of Harrison, um, thanks to Eric Idle, um, heard about the project and said, yes, you know, I'll, I'll, I'd like to do it, you know. What we did was um, we pawned my house and the office in London and uh, to get a bank loan and that was a bit nerve-wracking. George put up all the money himself and in doing so set up the company Handmade Films that would go on to make Mona Lisa and a private function amongst others. And so several months later than planned in September 1978 the 41-day shoot began in Monastir in Tunisia. It was decided that Terry Jones should direct the film with Terry Gilliam in charge of art direction. This was a change from the Holy Grail film where both men had directed together, a situation that had caused some tension. They were sort of working on different ends of the spectrum at times and it did cause a fair amount of consternation. By the time they got to Brian, I think everyone in the group felt that they couldn't have two people again calling the shots. Gilliam wisely backed down, I think, because by then he'd made Jabberwocky, so he kind of felt, I'm going to go off and make my own movies anyway. Terry was important to be the director because I would have got caught up in all sorts of detail that would have riled the others. Because you know, John didn't want to wear this, and then, you know, they, they, they didn't want to do all the things that I think are important to uh, film, wearing uncomfortable clothes, having you know, grotesque makeup, all of those things. 
Terry and I sort of fell out at one point. I think I said something rather stroppy to Terry at some point because I thought he was he was <laughs> bending the cameraman's ear more, and I went, and I was I was wanting to sort something out. And it took Terry a long time to forgive me. I think he didn't speak to me for quite a while. I hadn't thought of that before now, but just thinking about it, he probably just kept out of my way because he was feeling so pissed off with me. I think there was a feeling right from the beginning, and the very first scene I think that was shot was the stoning scene that this could be very funny indeed. And so morale, morale was high. Matthias, son of Deuteronomy of Gath. Do I say yes? Yes. 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 You have been found guilty by the elders of the town of uttering the name of our Lord. And so as a blasphemer, you are to be stoned to death. Look. I'd had a lovely supper, and all I said to my wife was, that piece of halibut was good enough for Jehovah. Yes, for me! He said it again! We were there on day one, and, 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 and Jonesy was so well prepared, it was shot like that, I suddenly thought, my God, this is fun. Stuff by blind taxidermy. The shoot progressed smoothly. Behind the scenes footage shows a relaxed group of pythons enjoying themselves. Yes, it's another edition of Graham Chapman Rests. A series of 400 half-hour programs which look at the life of a man who rests a lot. When we were doing those crowd scenes where they all had to shout out, this is an Arab-speaking crowd, and some of them spoke a bit of French, but not English-speaking, so I assumed we'd have to dub on. And basically, I just shouted out to them what I wanted them to shout back. And, and actually, everybody just shouted back authentically what I shouted out to them. And we used the actual soundtrack at the end. It was quite it sounds really extraordinary. You've got to think for yourself. You're all individuals. Yes, we're all individuals. You're all different. Yes, we are all different. I'm not. Midway through filming, and in a bizarre coincidence, Spike Milligan suddenly popped up and was given a cameo. Spike happened to be in Tunisia because he was visiting um, the Second World War battlefields on which he'd fought. And he suddenly turns up in Monastir, can't get a room in a hotel because the entire Python team is there. So he came along one morning, he filmed his lovely little cameo, they all went for lunch, he just went, he didn't come back. And they had him scheduled for the afternoon for his close-ups and the rest of the scene, but he'd gone. He just said, I've had enough of this, I'm on holiday, and he'd gone off to look at some battlefield somewhere. But he still appears in the movie, and it is a great link between the goons and the pythons. Yea, he cometh to us like the siege of the grave. The scene that would be the hardest to film would also be the most controversial, the crucifixion of Brian. I remember vividly the, uh, always look on the right side, shooting that in this, it's quite a weird place. You know, arriving there on the morning of the shoot and seeing all these crosses up on the horizon. That was kind of a weird moment. And you kind of wondered where, where quite how people would respond to that because you know the images were so strong and 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 the idea that it became a song and dance number. And I can remember Eric singing this song to us, singing the the end song to us in in the hotel. I think. Cheer up, Brian. You know what they say. Some things in life are bad. They can really make you mad. Other things just make you swear and curse. When you're chewing on life's gristle, don't grumble, give a whistle. And this'll help things turn out for the best. Aye. Always look on the bright side of life. I wasn't over impressed by it, I have to say. <laughs> but we didn't have any other endings, so uh, and we thought it'd be quite funny, the whole thing. They also had the problem of actually filming it. It's very difficult being stuck up on a cross, one can imagine. They were actually up on the crosses for three days, and that's a lot of time. They had a little platform for the feet, just sort of on the middle of the cross, and of course a hidden bicycle seat that they could sort of perch on while they were up there. That's the thing. About four of us who were slightly tended to have chest problems uh, got really quite sick, and I remember thinking the day I was crucified, you know, I wasn't looking forward to being crucified, but be crucified when you got flu. <laughs> 
I always just thought it'd be funny having a song and dance routine on, on crosses. You know, everybody's tied to this place, they can't move. It was a wonderful bit of work by Eric, that song. So I think in a way we were all in our different ways working at our best. Certainly Ray was at his best as an actor. Uh, I was performing well, Eric was in good form. Um, uh, Michael was superb. Terry Gilliam made the film look good and Terry Jones was absolutely on top of his game as a director. So it was just one of those moments when it all comes together because usually in movies it all falls apart. The shoot was completed and Terry Jones began to edit the film in preparation for Life of Brian's scheduled release a few months later. But unbeknownst to the film crew, the secret was already out, because there was a traitor within its ranks. Someone had sent 11 pages of the script to Mary Whitehouse and the Festival of Light. The na Nationwide Festival of Light um, obtained the script from somewhere. I've, I've, no, I've no knowledge of that. The fact that they got the script means that somebody must have sent it to them that was associated with the film. The Festival of Light were appalled and wrote a letter to the British Board of Film Classification urging them to think of the consequences of allowing the film to be shown. It ended, I need not remind you of the wider implications of scurrilous abuse of God, Christ or the Bible. The lines were drawn for one of the great cultural battles of modern times. April 1979, while Terry Jones was working hard to finish Life of Brian, the Festival of Light began their crusade against it. They obviously don't like what they read, but they realize that if they go for this in a big way, then that may be counterproductive. So what they do is they adopt this kind of low profile, somewhat insidious campaign of saying, oh, let's all pray for the failure of Life of Brian. The Festival of Light, and Mary Whitehouse in particular, was on the warpath. The Python team were staring a possible prosecution for blasphemy in the face, so sought the advice of John Mortimer, the lawyer who defended gay news. They sought legal advice from me because I suppose because I'd done the blasphemy trial. And I think it was quite brave. I think it still is quite brave. And uh, they came to see me and I saw the film, which I thought riotously funny and it remains one of my favourite funny films. And, uh, and I gave it a legal opinion. There was one rather dangerous point where Michael Palin was, uh, was a leper and he was cured by Jesus. He was very angry, he said, oh, bloody do-gooder. Well, who cured you? Jesus did, sir. I was hopping along, under my own business. All of a sudden, up he comes, cures me. One minute I'm a leper with a trade, next minute my livelihood's gone. Not so much as a buy your leave. You're cured, mate. Bloody do-gooder. The Pythons decided to keep the character in. But another, called Otto, was right on the edge. Otto was a Jewish Nazi. 
Now, this really was quite delicate territory. It's right on the edge. Again, you're saying things you're not supposed to say, this time not about Christians, but about Jews in Israel. Important stuff to say, because it's, it, it's sort of cutting through the hypocrisy. In one particular scene, Otto talked to Brian about setting up a racially pure, all-Jewish community. It was a problem character uh, because, of course, this is not the sort of character that would appeal to an American film distributor, where uh, the Jewish lobby is very strong. The Otto storyline had to go. The only remnant in the finished film is his very brief appearance at Brian's crucifixion. You may remember that there's this rather strange bunch of sort of samurai-looking people who turn up at the end and commit suicide. That showed them who. I'm still not convinced cutting it out was the right thing, because I, I think that scene's really important. They obviously were points which a prosecutor would make much of, but our advice about the whole film was really founded on telling the court that Brian and Jesus were two different people, and that Jesus appears in the film as a separate character. Now, whether that's a very convincing defence, I don't know, but luckily we never had to try it out. Life of Brian was completed. The Pythons set out for America. It had been decided to open the film there first, home as it was to freedom of speech, the Constitution, and perhaps even more helpfully, not home to any blasphemy laws. The world premiere was set for New York on August the 17th, 1979. I just knew it was going to be fun. <laughs> and, and it was. They didn't let us down. They were out there parading, marching, screaming and shouting, you know, just like one would expect. Well, it seemed odd when the film came out that the the first group to complain about it uh, was the, a group that we'd never <laughs> imagined would want to have anything to complain about at all, and that was the uh, I think it was the New York Association of Rabbis, and we thought, well, why are they complaining? Um, I can imagine Christians complaining, but not rabbis. Um, and anyway, they were complaining about the use of the prayer shawl in the stoning sequence, which I mean, we didn't know it was the prayer shawl. We just thought it was a bit of costume. So when you're trading on delicate ground, you never know what you're going to be, who you're going to be offending. Rabbi Abraham Hecht was quoted in the trade paper Variety, accusing the film of being blasphemous, sacrilegious, and an incitement to possible violence. They knew they were in for a rough ride because they'd been told they must all make a will before they went to New York, since they had no idea whether um, they'd someone would take a shot at them or not. A group of rabbis and priests held demonstrations over this past weekend, and they were demonstrating against a movie called The Life of Brian. Well, the new Monty Python film is entitled The Life of Brian. It is a spoof of the life of Christ and has managed to offend just about every religious group in this city. Monty Python's Life of Brian, a film attracting much attention today outside the Warner Brothers building in Rockefeller Center. Demonstrators gathered to call the film blasphemous. Catholic, Jewish, Greek Orthodox, and Protestant religious leaders have all condemned the film. The New York Archdiocese officially on record against it. I mean, it wasn't a great surprise that there were going to be people who, who um, uh, disliked the film because we knew that there were certain people for whom the Bible story was untouchable. At one famous demonstration in New York, the Reverend Roger Fulton referred to the makers of the film as Monty Snake, people who he said needed a new heart, a new soul, and a new spirit. I think what really worried Roger Fulton was actually British humour, because uh, while he could, as a, as a believing Christian, make all these objections to the alleged blasphemy in the film, what really, I think, got up his nose was the fact that here were all these men dressed as women. You've got to remember that Christianity in America is mainly about sex. They're so deeply uncomfortable about every aspect of sex that they don't much care about wars or, or um, destroying the environment or, or financial corruption. But anything to do with sex sets them off. And it's because these people are operating at a very, very low level of mental health. They are incapable of understanding the teaching. As far as I understand, the majority of the religious um, um, reaction against the film was from people who hadn't seen the film. This is what makes me crazy, is this ability to just close, say, no, don't even look at that, don't even think about it. That uh, it's a way of keeping people, you know, ignorant, under control, and not thinking. And I think with Python, 
One of the things I thought we were all pretty proud of is trying to make people think. The US protests and marches only served to heighten media profile and increase takings. The original plan to open Bryan on 200 screens nationwide snowballed to near a 600. Certain states banned the film, especially in the Bible Belt, which only fanned the flames more. Life of Brian would eventually take over $20 million in the US alone. Back in the UK, the word about Life of Brian was spreading, and although the film wouldn't be on general release until the following year, on November the 9th, 1979, John Cleese and Michael Palin were invited to appear on a late night BBC Two discussion program to debate the film in the presence of Mervyn Stockwood, the Bishop of Southwark, and Malcolm Muggridge, born again Christian and well known friend of Mary. The stage was set for one of TV's all time great ding dongs. It was obviously going to be quite a heavy interview, perhaps the most, um, the strongest criticism we, we would face. Um, and John and I, I mean, I remember actually sort of mugging up for it, like for an exam, you know, going through my books and, yeah, sort of getting all the arguments together. When I look at that figure, I mean, I know you're going to say Brian is not Jesus, but I mean, that's just rubbish. The, uh, it was the, uh, the whole thing is quite clearly, if, there, if, if no Jesus had lived, that film wouldn't have been produced. And the bishop sitting there in all of his purple with the world's biggest silver crucifix, I've never seen one so big, fingering it, and the voices were all headmaster's voices and they were all dignified. It's quite humbug to say that this is not a, a, um, a ridiculing of the founder of the Christian religion and of the incarnation in an extremely cheap and tense-rate way. Muggeridge, um, until he was 60, was a well-known womanizer and drinker. And uh, um, I suspect to some extent he only got religion after he couldn't do anything else. And Mervyn Stockwood was, was a homosexual, as everybody knew, and uh, also, as it happens, a heavy drinker. As it went on, an extraordinary thing happened was that we were the ones with the serious points and they were the ones who were playing to the crowd. I simply don't think it was worthy of you. It was the sort of thing, as I say, that at Cambridge, the footlights did on a damp Tuesday afternoon, uh, or the lower fourth when I was a schoolmaster. Uh, you keep making the basic assumption that we are ridiculing Christ and Christ's teaching, and I say that we are not. But do you imagine that your scene, for instance, of the Sermon on the Mount, the scene in this, in your your film of the Sermon on the Mount, right. is not ridiculing one of the most sublime utterances that any human being has ever spoken on this earth. Of course, it is. No, no, it's Absolutely making fun not. of the guy who's remembered it wrong and of the people who don't understand it and miss mm. the point. Well, I think. I that think that's it's... really unfair because I think that a lot of people looking in will think that we have we have actually ridiculed Christ yes. physically. Mm. Christ is played by an actor, Ken Colley. He speaks the words. Um, from the Sermon on the Mount. He's treated absolutely respectfully. The camera then pans away. We go to right to the back of the crowd to someone who shouts, speak up, mm. because they cannot hear him. <laughs> now, I mean, if that utterly, no, no, that that utterly no, undermines that his faith in Christ, no, no, then I think your faith cannot be turned that. strong. Saying, I started off by saying that this is such a 10th rate film that I don't believe that it would disturb yes, I know you anybody's started with an open faith. mind. I realise that. I, 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 <laughs> said, I I'd never been so sort of angry uh, in public before, I don't think. I just, it was, it was just the way they dealt with it. The, the, the sort of venom used just, just because they liked the sound of the words. I was aware Michael was steaming, but I was kind of enjoying it because they annoyed me. And I reckoned that we were nailing them. I thought we were winning. And all you've done is well, to make a lot of people on a cross singing a music, a, a, a music hall song. Well, and, and a lot I of mean, people, it's so disgusting when you think of it. A lot of see? people go away very happy, laughing at that, their faith not touched one jot. I don't think I it'll really touch do. Your faith. I, I, don't I don't think it'll I had quotes in my pocket from Malcolm that absolutely validated our position and destroyed his own. And out of kindness, I didn't pull them out and read them out because I was feeling kind of sorry for him. Isn't that unbelievable? You have succeeded in reducing something which has inspired the greatest art into something which is presented in terms of the lowest art. If you That's said, your well, feat. That's if you your set feet. up your own terms that we have to influence people. We're not saying we want to influence no, people. I don't. We're trying to make them laugh, make yes. them happy. I mean, yes. it's, it's, that's something that helps. Gentlemen, I'm going to have to call a halt. I'm very sorry. I think
And just as it was being wound up, Mervyn the bishop delivered his pièce de résistance. I can't well, you'll get your 30 pieces. <laughs> you'll get your 30 pieces of silver. Well, I, I, I'm quite sure. <laughs> I hasten For to those of you who didn't attend Sunday school, this is a biblical quote and refers to the money that Judas was paid to betray Jesus Christ. Days later, the show, not the nine o'clock news, would send up the whole encounter, effectively turning the tables, with Rowan Atkinson as a bishop who had made a film based on the life of John Cleese. I mean, I actually find it deeply offensive that in a country that is still ostensibly a python-worshipping country, <laughs> that a 14-year-old child can actually get in to see this film. I mean, there is, there is little enough proper python around these days without parading this distorted garbage about. Bishop, you directed the film. Uh, did you expect this kind of reaction? <laughs> well, well, I certainly didn't expect the Spanish Inquisition. <laughs> In the UK, the British Board of Film Censors passed Life of Brian uncut with an AA certificate, meaning that anyone over the age of 14 could see it. This despite the lobbying from the Festival of Light, who had pushed for an outright ban. But that didn't mean the UK release of Life of Brian would be problem free, since it was up to councils to decide whether to show the film or not. And the Festival of Light now began to write letters to them, still pressing for a ban. If you've got the Festival of Light causing trouble, if you've got some fairly conservative views in your local area, then it is quite possible for any local authority to call in a film, view it, and say, no, it can't go on in our cinema, or to demand that it should be reclassified. And it worked. The film was banned in places like East Devon, Cornwall, Swansea, and here in Harrogate. Councillor Hitchin, why have you banned the life of Brian? Because from what we've heard about it, we think that it's going to be an extremely offensive film on religious grounds. Now, you've not actually seen the film, no, have you? No, we haven't. What reports have you had of it? Where have those reports come from? The reports have come from the Festival of Light, uh, and they have told us of the attitude of the American Catholic Church and the American Jewish Church. What do you know about the Festival of Light yourself? Nothing. What we said was that if you feel strongly about this film, you, what you have to do is you exercise your democratic rights and write to your local councillors who have authority over the cinemas and who can either reclassify a film or conclude that it's not appropriate for your area. The classic uh, kind of ignorant response to this was the councillor who said he didn't have to see the film because, you know, you don't have to see a pigsty to know that it stinks. Mary Whitehouse, Lord Longford, a few other people had a phenomenal power at that time. They really frightened the politicians, they could organise big demonstrations, they could particularly intimidate local politicians, they could get a grip on local councils, and that's of course where films were censored. And it was a very effective campaign and pretty dreadful for filmmakers. It was appalling that the life of Brian couldn't be seen everywhere. What I was proud about England was that where it was banned in different communities, you know, people would organize share bank parties and go to the communities where you could see it. I thought, the English, good for them. They're not going to be told what to think. Where Life of Brian was allowed to be shown, the religious protests continued to keep up the pressure. In Liverpool, leaflets were handed out by the city's mission, pointing out to the audience some of the lies, as they saw it, that the film contained, including number four, a blind man testifying to healing promptly falls into a pit denying the reality of our Lord's miracles. The master has healed me! I didn't touch him! I was blind and now I can see! I'm a miracle! I'm a miracle! And the most offensive part of the film, from the Christian community's point of view, was very definitely the crucifixion. They're insulting the saviour that we love, who shed his blood for us, who died for us, and this is what it's all about. To treat crucifixion, I think, as a sort of jolly boy's outing, I think that that really is something that I felt was really offensive. I have no sympathy whatsoever. Uh, any religion that makes a form of torture into an icon that they worship seems to me a pretty sick sort of religion, quite honestly. What do they do in the Christian church? They have 
Christ on the cross, a crucifix. What is that if it's not a graven image? It might have been tricky to see Life of Brian in certain parts of the UK, but in Norway it was banned completely. You had to go to Sweden if you wanted to see it, where cinemas proudly proclaimed, this film is so funny they banned it in Norway. Despite the protests and the bans, Life of Brian went on to take four million pounds in the UK alone and provide some of the most iconic comedy scenes. Crucifixion? Yes. Good. Out of the door, line on the left, one cross each. Next. All right, but apart from the sanitation, the medicine, education, wine, public order, irrigation, roads, a fresh water system and public health, what have the Romans ever done for us? People! of Jerusalem. Rome is your friend. <laughs> Beloved by many, in the UK it was recently voted the greatest comedy film of all time. It also marks perhaps the happiest and most creative period for the Pythons. I've always thought that Life of Brian's the best thing Python did by quite a long chalk. It's the one when we all are dust Life of Brian <laughs> made a difference, maybe. I'm curious if it did make a difference. That's what's interesting. But I do think it does, it gives hope to people who still want to think and laugh. Let us, like him, hold up one shoe and let the other be upon our foot, for this is his sign that all who follow him shall do likewise. Yes. No, 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 the shoe oh, no, no. is a sign that we must gather shoes together in abundance. Cast Hi. off the what? shoes, follow the good! Let us gather shoes together, let me. Follow the shoe, no, it's a sandal, follow the gourd, is my favorite scene because it is, in, in five minutes, we do the history <laughs> of any major religion and all of its heresies and its punishments and its madness. And I think that is an extraordinary scene. Hail Messiah! I'm not the Messiah! I say you are Lord and I should know I followed a few. Hail Messiah! The group scenes with the various members of, of the uh, Judean People's Front and PFOP, that was a lovely thing to play. Campaign for free Galilee. Oh, uh, People's Front of Judea, officials. Oh. What's your group doing here? We're going to kidnap Pilate's wife, take her back, issue the man. So are we. What? That's our plan. We were here first. What do you mean? We thought of it first. Oh, yeah. Yes, a couple of years ago. <laughs> there was invention going on there, as well as a basically a good, strong script. And I think scenes like that, everybody felt, you know, this is our one chance to get this. Brothers, brothers, we should be struggling together. We are. Oh. We mustn't fight each other. Surely we should be united against the common enemy. The, the Judean people's front. No, no, the Romans. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Almost 30 years on, the film still provokes controversy, still provokes debate. I, no, I didn't think it was funny. I thought that it was um, quite an insult, to be honest. Maybe it is being offensive to them, because uh, it is making fun of people who don't think for themselves. And that's exactly what the whole film's about. So I think it's quite right for people who don't think for themselves to get upset about it. We don't have the power to make films. We don't have the money to make films to lampoon Eric Idle, nor would we want to. But, you, but one of the things that um, puts, as it were, the Christian community at a real disadvantage uh, is that 
You know, our Lord himself said, if somebody strikes you, turn the other cheek. St Paul tells us, don't be offensive to anyone. I think it's extraordinarily rare for the religious to be funny or to be funny about their religions or even about anybody else's. I think um, there is a great humour vacuum at the heart of all religions. I don't think you ever want to hurt anyone's feelings, but sometimes, you know, as with the Islamic world now, there are certain things they believe in which are quite contrary to what we believe in. I don't really think our values are less important than theirs, so I guess you just have to have a clash and say, that's the way it is. Although the Pythons went on to make two more feature films, they never achieved the same success or impact as Life of Brian. Its legacy is unquestionable and it could easily be argued that it's more relevant today than when it was made. Now there's so many groups all demanding, don't offend, don't cause, it goes on and on and on. A Samaritan? This is supposed to be a Jewish section. It doesn't matter, you're all gonna die in a day or two. It may not matter to you, Roman, but it certainly matters to us, doesn't it, darling? Oh, rather. Under the terms of the Roman occupancy, we're entitled to be crucified in a purely Jewish area. Pharisees separate from Sadducees and Swedish separate from Welsh. It is entirely legitimate to criticise religions. It has to happen. We must be allowed to do it. We can't fall silent just because it's become more politically difficult. I think if you have a religion that can't bear being made fun of or laughed at or, or even attacked viciously, then it's not much of a religion. When you suddenly have to think to yourself, now, can I write this? Because uh, it might, maybe I'll be offending somebody some of religious susceptibilities or racial susceptibilities. I mean, it's ridiculous. I don't understand, well, I do understand, but I don't want to accept a world of such paranoia, of such thin skin, of such, that offence is the, causing offence is the, the greatest crime you can do to somebody. And as to whether Life of Brian could be made in the present day, well, I think it ought to be made today. I think we, everybody would think twice about doing it today because it is terrifying what's, what's happening and very, very dangerous. I think free speech is really under attack at the moment in a, a very devious way. As you get older, once you get to my age, and I'm 66 now, you realise the world's a madhouse and that most people are operating in fantasy anyway. So once you begin to realise that, it doesn't bother you very much. Comedy is not particularly difficult. You can get laughs doing any number of things, but to get laughs at an intelligent level about an important subject, ooh, that's good. <laughs>